like also people could, could define black hat as like hacking and that's kind of illegal i would not consider black hat to be something illegal it's probably something just pushing the lines of between the illegal stuff like hacking people's websites and injecting links illegally you know by doing damage or versus like just pushing the google guidelines a little bit too far but in terms of rankings it is not going to be a significant ranking change um and I, a lot of seo companies are selling that as a service for seo and i think that's kind of not true. As soon as some other search engine comes out that has a better search experience and that provides better quality results, right. Google's in trouble. Um, the question is, are they building their own search engine? There's been signs of that. It might just be signs that, hey, they're building like a better Siri or, you know, HomePods. Or Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Magazine 3 TV. Today we have a very, very interesting guest. Mr. Barry Schwartz, AKA Rusty Brick. Apart from being an SEO God, he is the CEO at Rusty Brick, founder at Search Engine Roundtable, which is one of my favorite SEO blogs and the editor at Search Engine Land. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for giving your time. We really ha appreciate having you and giving your time for us. Uh, I'm sure we will learn a lot of stuff from you. So, uh, Barry, let me just start from the basic question. What's up? What's up? Um, I don't know. It's been a busy uh, day. Lots of, I'm sorry if I get like a lot of pings and notifications. No, I apologize no, in advance. It's just one of those days that everything's blowing up. But yeah, thankfully everything is good. I can't complain. Life is great. Um, yeah, what's up with you? Uh, all, all going good. Uh, I cannot enjoy, I, I cannot be thankful to God for giving me this opportunity to let uh, to to be able to talk to you so no no it's all good no yeah. <laughs> thank you so uh let's just start from the beginning how did you got into the seo industry um how um i it's like probably a lot of people and we, so I, one of our clients back in i don't know 1999 2000 something like that was asking like how do i get into like you know the search engines like alta vista or excite back in the old days some of the mm -hmm. old search engines i'm like that's a good question so i started to like do some research on it and i found these amazing online seo communities like these old forums where i kind of joined in the early 2000s and started mm -hmm. to have conversations with people and to learn and you know meet people um so it was really out of like clients asking you know why do these how do these search engines work why do they work this way how do i take advantage of it um and from there i basically did a lot of research and i gave like a, a small seo seminar for that client and their colleagues around how search works and what you need to do to your website to make it get it ready to rank well in search um, and truthfully back in those early days not much has changed in the fundamentals around how search works Mm -hmm. um from like those days to today so which is pretty cool that's great so it was all the way back in 1999 huh yeah 99 2000 something like that oh. about 20 years so ago. right around right around the bubble right internet bubble yeah the internet bubble yeah um, there were multiple ones but the big internet bubble i think was like 97 98 like mm -hmm. some right so yeah. right around that time so how has been the journey? How have you seen uh, SEO community evolving? You have seen big, I, I don't think there was, people used to even consider it as an industry. W was it even? Yeah, I mean, there was, I mean, definitely was an industry. I don't think we called it SEO back then. Maybe mm -hmm. it was like search ranking. I don't know what, what it was called, but there were definitely online communities. There was, uh, Danny Sullivan was doing his newsletter mm -hmm. back, you know, in the late 90s um there were people like detlef johnson and mike grahan and uh, joe whalen there were a lot of personalities out there it was a much smaller community um but there were definitely these online communities um you know like jim's world and there was so many listservs and stuff like that and we even had some early conferences i don't know when the first conference was it was probably like 99 or 2000 um so yeah there was definitely a community back then Interesting. So uh, what was the first uh, CMS that you guys actually published search engine roundtable? How did it, how did the story of search engine roundtable, you know, actually started? Tell us, take us a little bit from there. Um, so it was actually on WordPress's competitor, a uh, company called Movable Type. Oh. I don't know if they're still around, they changed, I don't know. So I, I built it on that. I'm like, oh, I'll just take notes on what's changing um, in the SEO community. And um, 
and I did that. And I started to like go, I went to conference. I think the first time I actually wrote anything on there was covering like the, one of the conferences, maybe SES, Search Engine Strategy in Chicago in 2003. Um, or one of the early posts was back then about that. So I was covering SEO events and stuff like that. Um, and um, I started on movable type. Um, eventually movable type kind of didn't really last. So I moved it over to my own, I custom built CMS platform that I built specifically for Search Engine Roundtable. It's very lightweight, works very well. Uh, I need to really upgrade it and rebuild it, but it's so old that it just seems to work. But yeah, I mean, it basically started where I figured it'd be cool to document what I'm learning from the SEO community in a single place uh, and then let other people see that. Interesting. So is it is it on WordPress now? Nope, it's on a custom CMS platform. Search Engine Lens on WordPress, but my but Search Engine Roundtable is on a custom platform. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So. Um... Tell us a bit about, you know, your experience with, you have been uh, in the last 20 years, you have worked with many, many uh, giant players. And obviously you have had a pleasure to interact with Matt Cutts as well. Tell us that, that experience, how, how was it like? Um, it's interesting. So I don't know when I started, like the community, I was only like 22, 23. Um, so I was super young. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like meeting like pretty high level geniuses, like, you know, people who write algorithms and wrote wow. the initial search, how search works. Um, so it was a little bit, you know, intimidating, I guess, to meet these players, mm -hmm. um, people who, you know, way smarter than you and way more knowledgeable than you. Uh, but, you know, Matt Cutts is, you know, a genuinely nice person. Um, he respects in mutual respect across the board. Um, I met with him numerous times over the years, both when he, you know, was at Google, when he left Google and so forth. Um, and he's just a nice guy, got nice guy. Um, but a lot of people in the industry back then were, were nice. Um, he was a nice, even to people who were trying to game the system. So not that I was gaming the system, but he's just a nice person uh, in general. So yeah, I mean, the community was very, very respectful and nice. It was also somewhat shady as well. Um, back in the old, those days, you could get away with a lot of shady stuff in SEO. Mm -hmm. um, so it was that mutual stuff where, Matt Cuts was trying to like learn from you what you were doing that you shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. and how you were taking advantage of Google. And same time, you were trying to glean information off of Matt Cuts in terms of finding little hints. Um, but it was interesting. It was just a very interesting space, especially in those early days. Absolutely. I remember he had published a very, very long list of uh, YouTube videos and it was very helpful at that time to, uh, they covered, I mean, that was the first time when actually somebody from Google uh, broke a lot of myths and, and came out with some clean information. Right. So Matt Cutts actually, I don't know if you know this, um, he originally, obviously he was an engineer. He built algorithms. I think he worked on this first safe search filter and a bunch of other oh. things at Google. Eventually, you know, leading the search spam team or quality team. Yeah. Um, and he was actually took his 20% time, you know, Google's 20% time where you can do yeah. whatever you want, 20% mm -hmm. of your time. And he created what's called Google Guy at the Webmaster World Forums and different online forums. So he would actually go into these SEO forums and actually comment under the alias Google Guy. Nobody really knew who he was exactly. He didn't know if it was Matt Cotts or somebody else at Google. And he would actually, you know, respond to people's questions about Google search, how it worked, um, you know, myth busting and mm -hmm. all that type of stuff. So it was very, very, um, you know, interesting to see him do that. And yeah. then obviously, eventually we'd learned his name and, he didn't really like, we knew it was Matt Cutts and we knew it was a Google guy. We kind of figured it was the same person at one point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was really great to have somebody like that spend his, you know, 20% time or even a lot of his personal time traveling and speaking to people and going to conferences and, and also, you know, commenting in the SEO forums to help us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember it used to call webmaster forums. I'm not sure what, what they are calling it these days. Um, I think Google search central. Yeah, forms yeah. Are, like that. They're changing a lot of names. It's, it's, it, it can, it can get sometimes very confusing. So you are talking about the, you know, um, how Matt cut came and try to help people. And back then there used to be a black hat communities, right? I'm not sure if they're still around. There used to be a lot of forums talking about black hat stuff. And then there was this white hat thing and there was this black hat SEO, white hat SEO. Is that still around? It's changed a lot. I mean, the definition of what black hat is and what black hat is not uh, mm -hmm. also has changed a lot. Black hat SEO used to be about, 
you know, putting too much, you know, content on your page, white text, um, white text on, you know, white backgrounds, hiding things, like doing weird, weird cloaking maybe was a very, very yeah. black hat. And now like, now like, the, you know, and then, uh, you know, black hat is not, it depends on what you define it. So now some people are saying black hat is just, you know, building links or, you know, writing you know, low quality content. And that's really not necessarily black hat. I mean, link building is, you know, a PR thing if you do it right. And writing quality content is subjective. Um, in any event, um, there's also people who could, could define black hat as like hacking. And that's kind of illegal. I would not consider black hat to be something illegal. It's probably something just pushing the lines of between the illegal stuff, like hacking people's websites and injecting links illegally you know, by doing damage or versus like just pushing the Google guidelines a little bit too far. So there are black hat communities, some are public. Most of those black hat communities are private. You can't really see it without getting a private log into them. Um, but yeah, that's that's how it kind of is. It's, it's not it's not as easy as it is these yeah. days. Yeah, I, I don't think people even use that term. They do, I, I mean, I hear here, here and there. It's not as often as they used to. But yeah, yeah. Also yeah. The, the, the terminology using, you know, black hat versus white hat, yeah. I mean, it's, it's also not. I, so, I remember I remember a, a decade ago it, it got so crazy that there used to also be a called something called gray hat <laughs> so there were so many uh, uh, terms uh, yeah. in the industry so you obviously have uh, met a lot of geniuses and a lot of uh, smart peoples did you ever had a chance to meet Larry or Sergey I think I did at some of the Google dances. So in the mm. early days when we had SES events, uh, conferences, Google used to let us have their events, like a, like a party called the Google dance at their, at their Googleplex, at their headquarters. Uh -huh. So back in the early days, it was just a bunch of SEOs and PPCers um, going to that Google office. And then I think like Larry and Sergey would come out here and there for a brief second, just to like say hello and wow. then maybe have drinks with some people. Mm. Um, I don't think I sat one-on-one -on -one with any of them, but I'm pretty okay. sure I, I was with them at that event. Um, I'm not the type of person that like takes, and a lot of people like take pictures with the people they meet yeah, and stuff. Yeah, I yeah. never do that. Um, I don't know why, maybe I should have, uh, but yeah, I met definitely, definitely, you know, seen Larry and Sergey uh, over the years. I um, just can't pinpoint the first time I saw them in person. You, you obviously interacted with the Google core team at a very, very early age. Do you think it would, they would become this giant because I was just reading this article a couple of days ago. They are one of the most powerful organizations in the world. Like after US and Chinese government, they are the third most powerful organization in the world. Did you ever thought they would come out to be this powerful or this aggressive? Um, it's hard to know. In the early days, it was like, it's like, if you think about it, when they IPO'd, I'm like, mm. should I buy their stock? Should I not? I know they're like, <laughs> you know, search is very big, you know, but at the same time, 99% of their revenue came from those ads and that was their yeah. whole business. Mm. And there's still 90% of the revenue still comes from ads. Yeah. Um, so it was like, they didn't really diversify too much early in the early days, but now they have the uh, operating system. They have the Android phones. They have, you know, self-driving cars. They have every, you know, balloons that provide internet. Mm. Um, so they're pretty diversified now, but still most of their revenue comes from by far their Google ads. So, um, I knew Google search was very, very big, very, very important in the early days. Um, I just didn't, I don't know if anybody would know how big it would be, mm. um, but it's, it, it answers everybody's questions. Everybody goes there to get, to get an answer. So yeah, in hindsight, yeah, it's massive. I, I, I don't know if I knew how big, it, like, it's hard to say if I knew how big it would be today, mm. back, you know, 20 years ago. It's hard to say. I don't think they knew. Interesting. So uh, I, we just want to shift a little bit onto the SEO part. What are your thoughts on backlinks? Do they still matter? Yeah, I think they still matter. Um, they probably don't matter as much as they did 15, 20 years ago, but mm -hmm. they definitely still matter. And they're still a very, very important part of Google's algorithm. Interesting. So one should definitely spend time to build back backlinks or should it, should we just keep it organic? Let it build itself. No, keep it organic. I wouldn't try to fake it because a lot of building backlinks, um, the stuff that you spend your money and resources doing, um, are stuff that Google might ignore. So if you're paying for links, Google might just, you know, well, you know that they're paid links and they just, you're paying all this money and Google's just ignoring them completely. So I would just, just write stuff that people want to link to. You could definitely do outreach and say, Hey, I wrote this stuff, check it out. Mm -hmm. Tell me if you, you know, if you like it, but don't actively like pay for links or do link exchanges or anything that's easy to spam. It just it's do the, do it the right way. Right, right. I absolutely love that. A lot of people try to, you know, push me in the industry that you should do guest blogging, you should do this, you should do that. 
and I, I really never uh, really liked that, those kind of stuff. Building, uh, buying backlinks uh, never really worked. But yeah, uh, hearing from you is a validation for me. So, what are some myths about SEO? A couple of give us some myths uh, that you that comes close to your mind now. People ask me that question all the time. There's just so many. There's probably hundreds of myths. Um, the big one is obviously Google Ads. Top five. Has, it, top five. Google Ads inf influences organic results. So paying Google actually has an impact on your organic results. The answer is no. Okay. Um, uh, keyword density you see a lot. You know, mm -hmm. that's not a thing. Don't focus on keyword density. Don't focus on... Um, people always confuse domain authority. Right. So like using third party metrics and saying, Google, since I have a high domain authority with mm. Moz or whatever metric, you know, whatever SEM Rush has or whatever Majestic has, that means I should rank well. And people have been solving space off of that. That's a big myth as well. It doesn't, Google doesn't use those metrics and people just get bogged down by that. Um, uh, so many. Um, yeah, I mean, some of the like the easy stuff. If it sounds too, too easy to be, to, to just sounds too good to be true, it's probably not true when it comes right. to SEO. Um, so there's are really no hacks or tricks um, that are long-term that will work well. So just focus on the long game. Mm. Um, I don't want to name out too many myths. There's just, if you do a search for SEO myths, I'm sure you'll find tons of them. Um, but those are the top three probably. All right, guess. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the one that you have said is a very interesting one, relying on third-party data and then confusing it with the I mean, Google will never ever look at a third party, whatever, if, if I am or somebody else is saying it's domain authority is good, Google will not obviously take it into their algorithm. So yeah, that's, that's a very good one. So what are, for, what are some of your favorite SEO tools? SEO tools. I don't use many. Um, mm -hmm. I use search console, of course. Absolutely. Free. That, is, that is one of my favorite. Yeah. Um, I don't, use the rest so often, but obviously there's, I mean, it's hard because they sponsor some of the stuff I do. So SEMrush, mm -hmm. um, so they're very, very popular. Moz is kind of dwindling down a little bit since they got acquired in terms of popularity. Mm -hmm. ARFs is very, very popular. Um, I feel like I'm missing a ton. There's so many of them out there. If you do a search for SEO tools, I'm sure there's some great articles yeah, out there. I just don't use a lot of them. Many. I don't want to like name too many, but search console is the go-to. Obviously big webmaster tools is free as well. And that works pretty well as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I mostly use uh, a search engine console, but these days I've I've gotten uh, a subscription to Hrefs, and I think it's it's very interesting what data which you can explore. Talking about search console, what are your thoughts on Core Web Vitals, and do you see its approach to solving the performance and speed of overall web? Um, um I don't have high thoughts of Core Web Vitals. I think, you know, obviously Google wants to make the web faster, and they want to encourage. Uh, webmasters to make things faster and site owners to make things faster. Mm -hmm. And Core Web Vitals is something that people could, site owners could actually look at and say, are my sites getting faster? Yes, they measure a bunch of speed metrics. One of those speed metrics might change from FID to IMP and they're constantly going to adapt. But in terms of a core ranking factor, it's so light. It doesn't really influence rankings for the most part. And I think SEOs are selling that as a service mm -hmm. to say, if we improve your Core Web Vitals, your rankings will improve. That is not true. Your rankings will almost not, almost 99% of the time, not improve by making changes to your core web vitals to improve that. It's, you know, you could have really, you know, normal speed. You could have fat, super fast speed. Unless your site is like abusively slow, um, you're not going to really see any ranking declines because of poor core web vitals. So I know it's easy to measure. There is a win win situation. Yeah. You make a website faster, conversions increase, revenue increases, mm. users are happier. But in terms of rankings, it is not going to be a significant ranking change. Um, and I, a lot of SEO companies are selling that as a service for SEO. And I think that's kind of not true. Um, at the same time, it doesn't hurt. I mean, it's not, it's money well spent. It's just not going to impact your SEO. And a lot of SEOs are like, well, it did. Well, the truth is it didn't. It, it really didn't. You can't say this one thing influenced right. my rankings. There's hundreds if not thousands of factors mm -hmm. that can influence rankings. It's it's a part of a strategy. It can't be the only strategy, right? Yeah, but it's a, that is a really, really small part of the strategy. Mm -hmm. it's like yeah, absolutely. It might have just 1% weightage on the overall strategy. Yeah. So do you do you look at uh, your core web vital uh, on search engine roundtable? I don't look, I don't look at that often. I maybe looked at it when I'm 
I look at the stuff usually when I'm reporting about it. Like I'll look at it and say, all right, here's some screenshots I can embed in my reports. Uh, but I don't track it as a concern. Um, there are things like, you know, you want your main website to be 100%. You know, you want to mm. make it look good because you're, you know, if you talk the talk, you should walk the walk. Um, mm. But yeah, I don't think, I don't look at it as a thing that I'm concerned about. I do look at, you know, the search performance reports. I want to see what people are searching for, how people are finding my website. This way I can write better content around that type of stuff. I do look at, you know, indexing and crawl rates and stuff like that because I want to make sure everything is healthy there. But Core Web Vitals is something I'm not too concerned about because I know the website, when I go to it, a mobile, desktop, whatever, it loads pretty quickly. I'm mm-hmm. not, I mean, if, you know, if I'm looking for ways to improve stuff, I wouldn't spend my time or resources working on Core Web Vitals as long as I know the site's generally fast. I have many other things I need to work on on my own websites over Core Web Vitals um, that I think would make a much, have a much bigger bang for my buck. Interesting. So uh, while we are on the Core Web Vitals, why don't we talk about one more thing? Where do you see uh, Google AMP in the next five years? Gone? I don't think Google AMP is going to survive <laughs> so much longer. I I think they were trying to capture the HTML market and trying to make a replacement as an AMP HTML. Don't you think? Do you think it might survive as the Google Chrome did? Well, Chrome is, is used and it's very popular. Mm. Um, AMP is kind of dwindling down. It's not really gaining support. Um, people are removing support. I know Twitter had support for it. It got rid of it. A lot of publishers are angry with it because it's kind of serving up a separate URL and have these various issues. You have to make two different versions of your website. Mm. It's just something that I think, and Google been, hasn't been pushing it much. Even the AMP stories, which Google started to push a lot, they started to slow down pushing it. So I just don't see Google. Google has features they've used for a while. And AMP's been around for a while. It's not new. Mm. And you'll see Google replace those features over time. So I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if AMP is gone and replaced by, like, again, the core web vitals is why Google got rid of AMP is you can make your websites fast and AMP is right. not a factor anymore. To be in top stories and carousel, you don't need to have, have AMP anymore. You just need to do well with the core web vitals. So I think that's one sign that Google is going to get, slowly get rid of that over time. Interesting. So uh, I think uh, instead of AMP stories, they have uh, rebranded it as web stories. They're calling it web stories and, I, and they are pushing it very well. Any, I've seen publisher have huge, huge uh, traffic from coming from web stories because they are now showing it directly in the search results. Back then they used to show it the AMP result in the, in the main result. So yeah, I, I'm, I, I, I won't be surprised uh, if, if web stories take, take off, but yeah, it's all about sustainability, right? Five years down the line. Can this content type survive in the next five years? Th- that would be yeah i mean will it be 100 percent gone in five years I, I i think so i could be mm-hmm. wrong um mm-hmm. nothing's ever 100 percent gone i mean they, google has again had features that they've used and stopped supporting many many times over the years and mm-hmm. if you go to like the google graveyard if you search for it you'll see tons of their, google's own products that google has killed over the years yeah. so i don't think amp's going to be something that is around in five ten years from now true. you know is it gonna be gone in a year no but five years i would think it'd be gone True, true. So uh, web stories, right? It's a new content type. Are there any other new content types which you see which might be coming in the future? So we're seeing a lot of YouTube shorts and Facebook shorts and mm-hmm. Instagram shorts that are showing up in the Google search results. It's mm-hmm. something that's, you know, people should look into. I think we're seeing a lot more shorts, like short videos uh, showing up in web stories these days. So you can look into that format. Um, obviously there's constantly new schema and rich results that are coming out from Google. So stay on top of that. Mm. Um, those could you know, obviously increase your click through rates from the Google search results. If you have nice, rich results, um, what else is coming out? It, it, the Google lens stuff is pretty fascinating and it keeps getting better. Augmented reality and VR is, seems to be something that Google's pushing forward with. Um, so yeah, those types of more visual stuff that you see. So I would focus mm. on that. I mean, anything Google has is at Google IO. Uh, related mm. to search, you should definitely re- rewind and go to the Google I.O. event and see what you can gain from that because that's something that's kind of futuristic. Interesting. Interesting. What What is your take on DuckDuckGo? Um, they have slowly de- started to decline recently. I wrote an mm. article about it. Um, I don't know. I'm not a big privacy nut. I don't, you know, I feel like anything that you do on the internet, you should assume people will be able to find at that's one point cool. and you should just live your life anyway as a way that you're proud of and not like have to hide stuff that you're concerned about. I know I'm unusual. Most people like don't want 
anything they're searching no, for. No, I, I think I think what you are saying makes sense. I mean, th that's the whole point, right? Being online means there is an online identity. You keep it anonymous. It's your. It's in your hand. You keep it real. It's in your hand. But obviously, it will be tracked. That's how people are going to make money. I mean, people are at least people will use it for the research, right? I mean, it 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 privacy. I mean, yeah. as long as people don't misuse it, it's okay. People, we cannot be hundred percent private about uh in on right. the online. And I think that's proven. I think just a couple months ago, Duck something came out with Duck uh, from Bleeping Computer around Duck Duck Go and the privacy issues and how that the privacy search engine wasn't that, even that private. Mm -hmm. Um, which is one of the reasons why you see a decline in their in their traffic. So, um. Yeah, I mean, as long as I, as soon as some other search engine comes out that has a better search experience and that provides better quality results, right. Google's in trouble. And right. Microsoft Bing has been working on that for a long time. <laughs> and DuckDuckGo has been, and all these other search engines have come up over the years. The only one that's really lasting right now is Google, and Microsoft has, you know, a small market share. DuckDuckGo, you know, it's there. It's, I don't think it's going to be a big competitor. I think there are a lot of people who are trying to sell the privacy, right? There, this DuckDuckGo is there. Yeah. I think there is also a couple of browsers that came out. Those browsers are also yeah. selling the, yeah, Brave and all. So they are also selling the privacy. It's not the user experience and the and the and the qu quality of the result which be, uh, uh, somebody who is researching in the Google or or the web he might be if he is able to get 10x better result, which I don't think. There will ever be a product. Do you think there will ever be a product in the market which will give 10x better result when it compares to when it comes to researching on online? I can never say never. Um, I mean, yeah. nobody thought Google would be where it was, and I don't know. Even like Ahrefs is making their own search engine called Yep. Mm. So I don't know. We'll see. There's, it's always good to have competition, but again, it's been 20 years of Google and only Google. Um, mm. And there's been many, many search engines. Mm. Google do a search for search engines. Go to Wikipedia. You can see all the search engines that have come and gone over the years. Some of them were massive, like Yahoo was the number one destination for everything, and now it's sadly, you know, not it doesn't ha doesn't have any role in search. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you'll see that. I mean, Alta Vista, Excite, Lycos, these are all major brands in the old days, and nothing. And there's major search engines that were founded by former Googlers and engineers, and really backed by lots of venture capital money that just did not make it. And the question is why? And I think Google mm. has way too much of a lead with machine learning and data and so forth that it's hard to compete. You see Apple search and Facebook, have, they even, they, they've been talking about it for years and they haven't gone in that space. Okay. So who knows? There, there was also, there was also used to be a search engine called ask.com. I, I think you remember that. <laughs> yeah, it used to be called Ask Jeeves. They rebranded yeah. to ask.com. Um, yeah, they were pretty they were pretty popular back in the old days yeah, yeah. as well. So. And then there was a, also this AOL. Uh, they, AOL all, search was actually powered by Google for, okay. for many, many years. It still is, I think. Yeah. I could be wrong. Um, we've heard, we've seen some uh, rumors online that Apple might work on the search engine. Do you think that's true? So we've seen signs of that for the past several years. I mean, you saw mm -hmm. Apple bot showing up in people's crawlers. Mm. Um, they spend, I mean, they, they get paid $6 billion, I think last year alone from Google, just to be the default search provider on Safari wow. mobile and desktop. So that's a lot of money. Um, and I think they feel like there's probably money to be made there. Um, the question is, are they building their own search engine? There's been signs of that. It might just be signs that, Hey, they're building like a better Siri or, you know, home pods, or they're building better, like spotlight search on Apple search. So it's hard to say, I would love to see an Apple search, uh, search that, engine. I think that would be, be an cool. amazing competition. I, I think I would consider Siri as an, a search engine, right? Siri is a, uh, it is in some level. It's, it's, search, it's I mean, kind they, of a search engine. It's trying to give the same results from the web. I don't think they use, they must be using proprietary data, right? Because they, they would need to do the data to go through some algorithms. So they have right their own algorithms to detect to figure out which search provider they should use. They have different relationships with like you know sports sites, weather sites, mm. Wolf on Alpha for data, math. Yeah. Lots of different partnerships they have, and they also have that partnership with Google on some level. So um, yeah, they definitely have different partnerships to say which results should be triggered by which. And you can't compare. I mean, Siri is great, but it's nothing compared to Google Assistant. Yeah, and um, let's talk about spam a little bit. Um, how 
is spam a real thing now uh, i mean we there was huge huge spam uh, issues i i remember back in 2010 2012 uh, the spam was very very high when it comes to forums and online communities nowadays it's kind of it's becoming very easy for or maybe the companies have evolved too much to fight the spam but is, is spam are, are we going to see the spam in the next 10 20 years sure yes um it's obviously a lot harder to get away with spamming but there's definitely spam google has a huge team just devoted to search spam um google says they block like 90 something like 99% of spam and stuff like that they release their search spam um report every year and it's always getting better and better but they're constantly adapting they're getting making it better so as google gets better search spammers get better same thing with email spam there's constantly people evolving and trying to like find loopholes to do that it's much harder to find these days but there will always be as long as there's a search engine there will always be a search spammer interesting so whenever we are analyzing the spam traffic why is it that majority of those spam is coming from china or russia why is it that i i always wonder about this i don't know i i haven't looked to see where the spam is coming from i don't know if it's always those two countries to be honest i mean the majority um, of that uh, i mean 60 to 70% from those two or three countries and then rest of them are are it's it's very interesting i i i'm always curious about that thing it depends on where you could define this as spam obviously some of the legal stuff you know it's much easier to get away with illegal activity in certain countries and in other countries like in america you can get caught you go to jail uh, some other countries right. are enforcing things i don't i don't know about those specific countries hmm. but so um data yeah. laws i assume so hmm. um, i'm not sure interesting so i was just going through your profile on on one of the seo blogs and i hit authors and i saw 30000 articles on your name is that real is that even i mean how is that even possible you have read, you have literally written 30000 stories on the website yeah so on search engine round table i've written about uh yeah it should be accurate i mean it's just the data feed uh 30000 almost 30, yeah 30700 wow. and 28 as we're speaking to right now on search engine land i put in quickly tell you how quick how fast how many articles i've written i've written um almost 9000 on search engine land wow. so i probably written in search engine watch uh, yeah so i probably written over 40000 articles on, on search wow. in the past almost 20 years and probably these are the published articles yeah published articles these are probably wow. 5 to 10 per, per day wow how do you even write that much of content I type fast they're short my my stories are pretty short they're not like long you know 4000 5 10000 word articles they're usually like a few paragraphs mm. this is what's new they're pretty quick i it usually takes me about 5 5 minutes or so to write something interesting so um two decades 40000 blog post how do you keep yourself stress free this is the the blogging is the, is the least stressful this is a hobby i don't i don't really blog for money i i make some money for doing so obviously but my main income is from my my company rusty brick where we do software development the blogging is my hobby it's like people like to go fishing or like to play sports or like to mm-hmm. watch a movie i do blogging as my hobby it's my it's my outlet my 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 stress my stress outlet i guess interesting interesting what else do you do to keep yourself stress free like we, uh, we don't talk about mental health and all that kind of stuff in in we are we are so deep dive in the seo and all that kind of stuff but it's very important for us to learn from the experienced people on how how you have you know you have you have really played the long game and and people look up to you so it would be great if you can share like how, what are some things you do to keep yourself mentally stable or you know how do you yeah, how do you keep your check um, and balance between the life and the stress I'm probably the worst person to ask that uh to be honest. I don't. Um if you tell any mental health professional and they look at my life, they'll tell you I got it wrong. I mean, I I am a workaholic. I mm-hmm. don't take time off. If I'm off on vacation, I will wake up hours hours before my family is up um to make sure to get stuff done. I'll be exhausted throughout the day. I don't handle the work life balance well. Um I thankfully am okay with mental health wise i think although i'm sure if you ask a mental health professional it'd be like no you you probably will break one day but i've been doing this for a long time i've been uh, i haven't really done so yet um but i do think you know 
do what you love. I, I love this stuff. Um, mm. And that's important. So it doesn't feel like work necessarily. Right. Um, I don't we feel like it. I need the break. Yeah. But I do feel a responsibility of, of making sure to cover stuff when I'm offline mm. or when I'm on vacation. So that's kind of annoying. At the same time, I like doing it. And it's a responsibility that I, I honestly honor and cherish. So it's something that I find to be very, you know, I'm honored by it all. Uh, but I wouldn't use myself or any advice from me in terms of how you should live your life in terms of work-life balance or in terms of mental health. I'm probably the worst person for that. I think I think one has to be passionate. And and if you love what you do, you don't need to do anything else. I mean, that that basically covers everything else. And And it's just that you are passionate. There's nothing wrong about that. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you should do so if you can, you should do something you love and that will make it much easier. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what is, what is your one advice for new people who are coming to create content or people who are new in the SEO community? Yeah, I think you touched on it. I mean, the main thing is be consistent. The mm -hmm. long game is very important. It's not like you're going to one day write a call five blog posts and then automatically get crazy traffic. It takes years and years and years of consistent ongoing work to get there. Uh, make sure to read a lot. Make sure to share a lot. Don't be afraid to like share and talk to the community. Um, make sure to, you know, you know, continue to, you know, learn and also test a lot. Try new things. Don't be afraid mm -hmm. to try things. Um, you will get things wrong. People will, you know, especially in the online world, they might go ahead and say some harsh things. Don't let it get to you. You'll be fine. Uh, you'll move on. You could, you're human. You can make, you can correct things that you've written online, mm -hmm. update them. And just take the feedback in, don't take it personal and just keep being consistent and do what's right. And make sure again, link to the sources. Can't stand when people don't link to sources. It drives me insane. People literally copy and paste stuff that people write and don't even link to where they get it from. Mm. And the whole purpose around community is sharing and amplifying everybody else. And you could do that and not, it won't take away from anything that you're doing. As long as you amplify, all I do is link to other people. That's everything I do. Um, and it hasn't hurt my reputation by doing so. That's great, man. That's a great advice. And I think people will learn a lot from this interview. I know I personally have, and it's been such an honor and pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's an honor talking to you as well and keep up the great work. Thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate this. I hope we speak soon. Same here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care.